He aimed his deadly arrow at Antonus. The young man sat there, just about to lift his golden goblet, swirling wine around, ready to drink. Odysseus aimed at his throat, then shot. The point pierced all the way through his soft neck. He flopped down to the side and his cup slipped out of his hand. A double pipe of blood gushed from his nostrils. His foot twitched and knocked the table down. Food scattered on the ground. The bread and roasted meat were soiled with blood. Seeing him fall, the suitors, in an uproar, with shouts that filled the hall, jumped up and rushed to search around by all the thick stone walls for shields or spear to grab. But there were none. They angrily rebuked Odysseus. Stranger, you shot a man, and you will pay. You will join no more games. You must die. For certain you have killed the best young man in all of Atheca. Right here the vultures will eat your corpse. Those poor fools did not know that he had killed Antinous on purpose, nor that the snares of death were round them all. Clever Odysseus scowled back and sneered. Dogs, so you thought I would not come back home from Troy, and so you fleeced my house, and raped my slave girls, and flirted with my wife while I am still alive? You did not fear the gods who live in heaven, and you thought no man would ever come to take revenge. Now you are trapped inside the snares of death. At that, pale fear seized all of them. They groped to find a way to save their lives somehow. Only Eurymachus found words to answer. If it is you, Odysseus, come back, then we agree. Quite right, the Greeks have done outrageous things to your estate and home. But now the one responsible is dead, Antonus. It was all his idea. He did not even truly want your wife, but had another plan, which Zeus has foiled. To lie in ambush for your son and kill him then seize the throne and rule in Atheca. Now he is slain, and quite rightly. Please, my lord, have mercy on your people. We will pay in public, yes, for all the food and drink. Your anger is quite understandable. Odysseus saw through him. With a glare, he told him, Even if you give me all, your whole inheritance, and even more, I will not keep my hands away from slaughter until I pay you suitors back for all your wickedness. You have two choices. Fight or run away. Only try to save your lives. Not one of you will escape death. At that their knees grew weak. Their hearts stopped still. 
Eurymachus again addressed the suitors. My friends, this man will not hold back his hands. Seizing the bow and arrows, he will shoot us right from that polished threshold, till he kills each one of us. Be quick, make plans for battle, draw out your swords, use your tables as shield against the deadly arrows. Altogether, rush at him, try to drive him off the threshold and route the doors. Then run all through the town and quickly call for help. This man will soon have shot his last. He drew his sharp bronze sword, and with a dreadful scream he leapt at him. But that same instant Lord Odysseus let fly and hit his chest, beside the nipple, and instantly the arrow pierced his liver. The sword fell from his hand. He doubled up and fell across the table, spilling food and wine across the floor. Amphinomus attacked Odysseus. He drew his sharp sword, hoping he could force him to yield his place. Telemachus leapt in and thrust his bronze spear through him from behind, ramming it through his back and out his chest. Face first, he crashed and thudded to the ground. He ran and quickly reached his loyal father, and stood beside him as his words flew out. Now, father, I will fetch a shield for you and two spears with a helmet made of bronze and I will arm myself and bring more arms for our two herdsmen, since we all need weapons. Odysseus, the master planner, answered, Run fast while I still have a stock of arrows before they force me from the doors. I am fighting alone up here. His son obeyed. He hurried to the storeroom for the arms and took eight spears, four shields, and four bronze helmets, each fitted out with bushy horsehair plumes. He hurried back to take them to his father, and was the first to strap the armor on. The two slaves also armed themselves and stood flanking their brilliant resourceful leader. As long as he had arrows he kept shooting, and one by one he picked the suitors off inside his own home. Then at last the king ran out of arrows. He set down his bow. He slung the fourfold shield across his shoulders, and put the well-made helmet on his head. The crest of horsehair gave a fearsome nod. He grasped a bronze-tipped spear in either hand. Those were the most heroic of the group who still survived and battled for their lives. The others were defeated by the bow and raining arrows. Age loss told them, Now force this cruel man to stay his hands. Do not hurl spears at him all in a mass. But you must, Six, shoot him first and pray, Lord Zeus. We strike Odysseus and win the fight. Once he is down, the others will be nothing. The six men threw their spears as he had said. At once Athena made their efforts fail. The group of four avoided all of the suitor's spears. Odysseus had waited long enough. Odysseus killed Demoptilemus. Telemachus, Euryades, the swine herd slaughtered Elatus, and the cow herd killed Pisander. They all fell and bit the earth. The other suitors huddled in a corner. The four rushed up from the corpses, pulled their spears. Again the suitors threw their weapons. Again Athena made them fail. The competent, sharp-eyed Odysseus and his companions hurled their piercing spears into the swarming throng. The city-sacker skewered Eurydamus. Telemachus slashed Amphimedon. The swineherd struck at Polybus. The cowherd sliced right through Stesipius's chest. Odysseus moved closer with his spear and pierced age loss. Telemachus thrust at Leocritus and drove his bronze into his belly. He fell down headfirst, face smashed against the floor. The frightened suitors bolted through the hall like cattle. Screaming filled the hall as skulls were cracked. The whole floor ran with blood. Odysseus scanned all around his home for any man who might still be alive. 
who might be hiding to escape destruction. He saw them fallen, all of them, so many lying in blood and dust heaped across each other. Odysseus summoned the herdsman and Telemachus and spoke winged words to them. Now we must start to clear the corpses out. The girls must help. Then clean my stately chairs and had some tables. When the whole house is set in proper order, restore my halls to health. When Eurycleia came, Odysseus told his beloved nurse, Now bring me fire and sulfur as a cure for evil things, and I will fumigate the house, and call Penelope, her slaves, and all the slave girls inside her house. The old nurse ran all through the palace, summoning the women. By torchlight they came out from their apartments to greet Odysseus with open arms. They kissed his face and took him by the hands in welcome. He was seized by sweet desire to weep, and in his heart he knew them all. Chuckling with glee, the old slave climbed upstairs to tell the queen that her beloved husband was home. Her weak old knees felt stronger now. With buoyant steps she went and stood beside her mistress at her head, and said, Dear child, wake up and see. At long last you have got your wish come true. Odysseus has come. He is right here inside this house. At last he slaughtered all the suitors who were wasting his property and threatening his son. But cautiously Penelope replied, You poor old thing, the gods have made you crazy. They have the power to turn the sanest person mad or make fools turn wise. You used to be so sensible, but they have damaged you. Why else would you be mocking me like this, with silly stories in my time of grief? Why did you wake me from the sleep that sweetly wrapped around my eyes? I have not slept so soundly since my Odysseus marched off to see that cursed town, Evilium. Go back. If any other slave comes here to wake me and tell me all this nonsense, I will send her back down at once. And I will not be gentle. Your old age will protect you from worse scolding. But Eurycleia answered with affection, Dear child, I am not mocking you. I am telling the truth. Odysseus is here. He is the stranger that they all abused. Telemachus has known for quite some time, but sensibly he kept his father's plans a secret, so Odysseus could take revenge for all their violence and pride. Penelope was overjoyed. She jumped from bed and hugged the nurse and began crying. Her words flew fast. Dear Nanny, if this is the truth, if he has come back to this house, how could he have attacked those shameless suitors when he is just one man and there were always so many crowded in there? Eurycleia answered, I did not see or learn the details. I heard the sound of screaming from the men as they were killed. We huddled in our room and kept the doors tight shut until your son called me. His father sent him. Then I saw Odysseus surrounded by dead bodies. They lay on top of one another, sprawled across the solid floor. You would have been thrilled if you saw him, like a lion drenched in blood and gore. Now they are all piled up out by the courtyard gates and he is burning a mighty fire to fumigate the palace, restoring all its loveliness.
He sent me to fetch you. Come with me so both of you can start to live again in happiness. You have endured so much misery. Your wish came true. He is alive. He has come home again and found you and your son, and has taken revenge on all the suitors who abused him. Penelope said clearly, Do not start gloating. As you know, my son and I would be delighted if he came. We all would. However, what you say cannot be true. Some god has killed the suitors out of anger at their abuse of power and their pride. They fail to show respect to visitors, both good and bad. Their foolishness has killed them, but my Odysseus has lost his home, and far away from Greece he lost his life. The nurse replied, Dear child, how can you say your husband will not come when he is here, beside the hearth? Your heart has always been mistrustful, but I have clear proof. When I was washing him, I felt the scar made when the boar impaled him with its tusk. I tried to tell you, but he grabbed my throat and stopped me spoiling all his plans. Come with me, I swear on my own life. If I am lying, then kill me. Wise Penelope said, Nanny, it must be hard for you to understand the ways of gods despite your cleverness. But let us go to meet my son so I can see the suitors dead and see the man who killed them. So she went downstairs. Her heart could not decide if she should keep her distance as she was questioning her own dear husband or go right up to him and kiss his face and hold his hands in hers. She crossed the threshold and sat across from him beside the wall in firelight. He sat beside the pillar and kept his eyes down, waiting to find out whether the woman who once shared his bed would speak to him. She sat in silence, stunned. Sometimes, when she was glancing at his face, it seemed like him. But then his dirty clothes were unfamiliar. Telemachus scolded her. Mother, cruel, heartless mother, why are you doing this, rejecting father? Why do you not go over, sit beside him, and talk to him? No woman in the world would be so obstinate. To keep your distance from him when he has come back after twenty long years of suffering. Your heart is always harder than stone. But thoughtfully she answered, My child, I am confused. I cannot speak or meet his eyes. If this is really him, if my Odysseus has come back home, we have our ways to recognize each other, through secret signs known only to us two. Hardened Odysseus began to smile. He told the boy, You must allow your mother to test me out. She will soon know me better. While I am dirty and dressed in rags, she will not treat me with kindness or acknowledge me. Eurynome, the slave woman, began to wash strong-willed Odysseus, and then Athena poured attractiveness from head to toe and made him taller and stronger. and his hair grew thick and curly as a hyacinth. After his bath, he looked like an immortal. He sat down in the same chair opposite his wife and said, 
extraordinary woman. The gods have given you the hardest heart. No other wife would so reject a husband who had been suffering for twenty years and finally come home. Well, Nanny, make a bed for me so I can rest. This woman must have an iron heart. Penelope said shrewdly, You extraordinary man. I am not acting proud or underplaying this huge event. Yet I am not surprised at how you look. You looked like this the day your long oars sailed away from Ithaca. Now, Eurycleia, make the bed for him outside the room he built himself. Pull out the bedstead and spread quilts and blankets on it. She spoke to test him, and Odysseus was furious, and told his loyal wife, Woman, your words have cut my heart. Who moved my bed? It would be difficult for even a master craftsman, though a god could do it with ease. No man, however young and strong, could pry it out. There is a trick to how this bed was made. I made it, no one else. Inside the court there grew an olive tree with delicate long leaves, full-grown and green, as sturdy as a pillar, and I built the room around it. I packed stones together and fixed a roof and fitted doors. At last I trimmed the olive tree and used my bronze to cut the branches off from root to tip, and planed it down and skillfully transformed the trunk into a bedpost. With a drill I bored right through it. This was my first bedpost, and then I made the other three, inlaid with gold and silver and with ivory. I stretched ox leather straps across, dyed purple. Now I have told the secret trick the token. But woman, wife, I do not know if someone, a man, has cut the olive trunk and moved my bed, or if it is still safe. At that, her heart and body suddenly relaxed. She recognized the tokens he had shown her. She burst out crying and ran straight towards him and threw her arms around him, kissed his face, and said, Do not be angry at me now, Odysseus. In every other way you are an understanding man. The gods have made us suffer. They refuse to let us stay together and enjoy our youth until we reach the edge of age together. Please forgive me. Do not keep bearing a grudge because when I first saw you, I would not welcome you immediately. I felt a constant dread that some evil man would fool me with his lies. Now you have told the story of our bed, the secret no other mortal knows except yourself and me, and just one slave, Actorus, whom my father gave to me when I came here, who used to guard our room. You made my stubborn heart believe in you at last. This made him want to weep as well. He held his love, his faithful wife, and wept. They would have wept until the rosy dawn began to touch the sky, but shining-eyed Athena intervened. She held night back, restraining golden dawn beside the ocean, and would not let her yoke her swiftly on colts shining and bright. And when the couple had ceased their weeping, and then enjoyed their love-making in their shared bed, they shared another pleasure, telling stories. She told him how she suffered as she watched the crowd of suitors ruining the house, killing so many herds of sheep and cattle, and drinking so much wine because of her. Odysseus told her how much he hurt so many other people, and in turn how much he had endured himself. She loved to listen, and she did not fall asleep until he told it all. A 
Athena, bright-eyed goddess, stayed alert, and when she thought Odysseus had finished with taking pleasure in his wife and sleep, she roused the newborn dawn from ocean streams to bring the golden light to those on earth. The End <laughs>